Sorry about that. I'm Christina Bush. I'm with the, I'm a toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Been involved in this site since about uh, 2012, when we first issued the Do Not Eat advisory for the fish in the Clark's Marsh. Um, first, I want to. I'm going to try to stay here. So, folks on this side of the room, are you able to sort of see around me? I'll try to. I'll try to do a little weaving back and forth. Okay, and the sound is okay. All right, and. Dale, I may be able to forward these on my own. Let's see. By golly, I can't. <laughs> okay. All right, so the, my, my talk is going to just give you a quick introduction to who we are, how we get involved in these types of sites at the, at the State Health Department. Then I want to talk briefly about the PFCs in fish. That's how this whole thing started for us in the State Health Department. And there is a report out there that uh, I'll tell you about that you can review and provide us comment on if you so choose. And then I know the crux of the matter tonight is the PFCs in the groundwater and the drinking water. Next, please. Okay, so who, who, is, who are these MDHHS people and what are they doing here? I come from the Division of Environmental Health at State Health Department down in Lansing. We do not have regional offices like the DEQ and the DNR does do. Um, the section that I am in is the toxicology and response. So we get into the science part of this and we, we do a lot of responding, whether it is the Superfund sites uh, where it's, it's an ongoing issue, and in some cases we, we get involved at emergency release sites. Some of you may have heard about the Enbridge oil spill in the Kalamazoo River that happened in 2010. That was something that we were involved in. So we're in a, in a gamut of, of response situations, and the work that we do is funded by the Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. They are a branch of the CDC down in Atlanta. They fund the work that we do, and uh, they, they were created when the Superfund legislation came around, and they work at providing the public health side of things at cleanup sites, primarily Superfund sites. So the EPA or the DEQ for, for within the state work at the cleanup side of things, we look at is there a public health, is the public being exposed and could that exposure be harmful to them? We, need, we look at it from that aspect. We also partner with local public health and with other agencies. So it's not always the EPA and the DEQ. Maybe we're working with the DNR. Maybe we're working, uh, you know, in this case, the Air Force is an agency that's part of our work group. So, um, next slide, thank you. All right, this is the first apology in my talk tonight. The, there's, there's evolution in the scientific community about what these chemicals are being called. When we started here, the general terminology was perfluorinated compound, perfluorinated chemical. Dale used the term perfluoroalkyl or something like that. Um, and that is what I'm sticking with tonight. Uh, it's just the way that the chemistry is. But more scientists are moving towards this PFAS. Dale used, Dale used that in one of his slides. Uh, you may see it if you are doing your homework and getting on the internet to find out more about these chemicals. And it's just a, a more complete description of the chemical group that these fall into. Uh, so, as, a, as I said, for this meeting, I'm sticking with PFC. That is what we are familiar with, for those of you who have been um, at, present at our previous meetings. So, uh, Air Force Base. So, I'm going to first focus on the fish situation, which started here in Clark's Marsh, and then uh, do talk, I will also include discussion of the fish that were sampled in the Asabel in Benetton Lake and EPA actually did some sampling out here. Tell you what our recommendations are as far as eating how much fish from which water body in regard to PFCs. And then we will get into the uh, discussion on the groundwater and drinking water. So PFCs and fish. I want to give you a timeline of how things happened, and I think Dale already touched upon this. In 2010, MDEQ started looking for PFCs at the fire training area. 
They found them. 2011, MDEQ sampled fish in the Clark's Marsh ponds and tested for PFCs. They found them. In 2012, it usually takes about a year between when the fish are sampled and when the analytical results, when the analytical work is done and the results are available after being properly vetted through uh, review. So in 2012, we received that data and on the same day, we issued a do not eat advisory for the fish in Clark's Marsh. The advisory uh, expanded out to the Osable River for non-migratory fish. So the, the fish that are in the river year round, we felt that it's important that you not eat those because of the um, uncontrolled contamination at the, at the base at that time. Um, and then we had our first public meeting after quite a few months of preparation with federal, state, and local partners uh, in 2013. We've been meeting every year since, and we haven't been meeting here. We've been meeting over in the township hall because that fit everybody, and it wouldn't have done so tonight. And we, can, we provided additional outreach, too. The advice that we have, again, is do not eat the fish that you catch from Clark's Marsh. There's also a small lake that is west of the ponds in the marsh, and that's Allen Lake, and we suggest not to eat the fish from there either. There's a, there, we are, we're getting some data that suggests that they may have some high levels of PFCs in them. Then for the Osable, we did collect more data, and we feel confident at this time, still do not eat from the non-migratory fish there, the resident, what we're calling resident fish. So that's uh, sucker, pumpkin seeds, smallmouth bass, those types. But the migratory fish coming in from Lake Huron are not impacted as seriously as these fish. They, they have hardly any levels of PFCs in them. Dale, Dale and Bob both said, I believe, that PFCs are a global contaminant, so we are going to find them in surface waters. They go up into the air, they're released by manufacture, by, um, when, when they are manufactured, when they're used in other, um, other manufacturing processes, and then they come down somewhere else, coming down with the rain, and we can find them in the Arctic, the Antarctic, and in between. So they're going to be in surface waters, and that's an important point when we get later on in our talk. So can you go back a, a step, please, Dale? Uh, let me talk about Vanetten Lake. We did test fish from there, but the, they are collecting, they are um, building up some PFCs in them, certainly not to the extent of what's in Clark's Marsh. The Clark's Mars fish are do not eat. If we did not have to think about the possibility of mercury in the inland lakes, and Bennett Lake is one of those uh, lakes where we have to think about that, if we didn't have to think about mercury at Bennett Lake, then we might have some eat safe fish guidelines. I say eat safe fish, that's our fish advisory. Eat safe fish guidelines in regard to PFCs for fish at Vanetten Lake. But essentially, our mercury advice trumps that. Um, and I want to point out, yes, do go to the next slide, please. For, among our outreach, this book was available, and I'm not sure if we have any more, but they are available online, and this is 2015's anyways. 2016 should be coming out uh, next month or in May. This is our Eat Safe Fish Guide for the Northeast um, uh, area of Michigan, Northeast Lower Michigan. <laughs> Within this guide, we have our general advice for where um, either the water body has not been sampled or a, a certain species of fish has not been sampled in that water body. And then in that case, we give gen general advice. If we have tested the fish for chemicals, then we list as far as whether or not we feel there should be um, what, the, what the consumption guidelines are. Can you eat 16 meals a month? Can you only eat six meals a year of those fish? 
Again, these are guidelines. You do not have the fish consumption police running around. This is just information that we are giving you so that you can make safe choices about eating a nutritious meal of Michigan fish. Um, and then before I go on to this slide, you can stay there though. Um, we also last, well, 2014, we prepared a, um, a, an area specific brochure about eating safe fish and what to look for in these water bodies. Then last year we updated it. We're gonna update it again this year. We had a few of these out. They might already have uh, gone to everybody who's here tonight. These are also available on our webpage. The commercial on that is at the end of the slides. So let me move on to the health consultation in fish. I do not have a bunch of these reports here in regard to the specific uh, deliberations that we made about the fish data that we had. So this is the formal report of the work that we've done these past few years as far as issuing the do not eat advice. To get this, if you want to review it, if you want to provide comment on it, there are hard copies available to read on site at the uh, township halls and at the library. You can also see it online, again, commercial at the end. Or if you want, let me know after tonight's meeting or contact me afterwards, my cards are on the table, um, and let me know and we will mail one to you so that you, can, that you can make comment. We do ask that you can get the comments to us by May 1st if you feel that that needs to be extended. Say maybe you're going to be, um, maybe there's a, a fishing, a fishing group that wants to send it out to uh, some researchers they know, say, hey, can you look this over? You can do something like that. And then when we, when we get those comments, we look through them, we respond to them, we may end up making changes to the report, but in that final report, we include the comments that were made and how we dealt with those. So, next one, please. So what's next for fish? The pump and treat system is already uh, installed and operating at the fire training station, uh, fire training area. We're going to be getting more fish data over time. I know the Air Force is planning on collecting data this year and there will probably be more collections done by the DEQ. We'll get analysis, we'll get them, we'll run them through our program in our division and make sure that you have the most up-to-date information so that you can make safe choices and we will conduct outreach as needed. Next slide, please. So let's move into PFCs and groundwater and I'm going to just grab a quick drink of water here, please. Okay, this is my next apology tonight. For those of you who received notification letters, the units that your ground, that your well water results came in were called micrograms per liter or parts per billion. When you saw the number, it was usually something like 0 0.004. And that's a lot of zeros to keep track of. So for, it's, it's more of a matter of perspective. So what I am showing in this presentation and then also in the evaluation report that I put together and there might be a few more over there. Those are gonna be online too. Um, to e it's easier to read the number to essentially put it into parts per trillion. So I'm getting rid of the decimal point and parts per trillion. So it's going to look like a larger number but the conversion, it's, it's a math thing. And after doing taxes, we're probably sick of math. But um, it's, it's just a matter of, I'm trying to make this just very easy to look at on the screen. Next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I think that these areas were pointed out and then there was a map over at the side of the room that the Air Force has as far as showing the areas where there were potential AFFF releases. The AFFF is the firefighting foam. And so these are going to be checked out this year. And then next slide, please. And then Dale showed this in his slides. This is 
This is a concept of what the groundwater may look like as far as PFCs in it. And this map is showing total PFCs in fish. The PFC we're, we're concerned about was a specific one. But with groundwater, we are kind of looking at the, the whole exposure uh, rather than just to a certain PFC. Uh, so, so you can see areas that have more. We've already talked about the fire training area and there's really no drinking water wells, to our knowledge, in this area. So I want to show slides that discuss a little bit of the numbers that we're seeing in the groundwater monitoring wells. Groundwater monitoring wells are different than drinking water wells. So next slide. So this was in the northern area of the base. I believe this is the, boy, yeah, the YMCA camp here. These are various locations that just have specific uh, names, if you will. And it's, boy, it's really hard to see here. Excuse me a second. Okay, for those of you who can see the numbers from there, and they, they are in the slide handouts. Uh, so some of the concentrations of P, PFOS, this was a specific PFC in the wells, because this is what I was uh, focusing on for the fish one, and this is in the, this, these tables are in the fish report. I have not got these tables, I have some of these tables, some of this information in the evaluation for the water. But some of the concentrations are up to almost a thousand parts per trillion in this northern end, and, in, and then Dale in the lower end, uh, we've got a whole bunch of other sampling locations, but we have concentrations in some of these monitoring wells going up to 15,000, 20,000 parts per trillion. Again, a monitoring well is different than a drinking water well, but it's telling us what may be coming down the pike. Maybe. There's still a lot that we don't understand about these plumes and that we need to know better. Next slide, please. So, timeline for PFCs in drinking water. In September of last year, the well at the mobile home park was identified, and as soon as we realized, wow, that's there. It got, we got a team out, both MDEQ and the Air Force were out there and did side-by-side -side sampling. Takes about a month for those to run through the lab. So the results were received and planning began for what's called the potable well survey. So that's for going out to the private residential wells. Sir? Which trailer It's been identified as the Whispering Woods Trailer Park. Okay. And uh, Dale, can you back up a slide? Whispering Woods is just outside the base boundary. It's right down here. Okay, so, there was, so the planning began, the plan was finalized, and in de early December, US Air Force and MDEQ went out again and began this private uh, residential well sampling. We got the results in 2016 and we started, we being uh, the state health department started preparing the understanding your well test results fact sheet. The third apology of the night. We, um, during the times when these letters were generated, the letters that those of you who had your wells tested received, you receive three letters in the mail and then you receive the local public health advisory. During the time that the letters went out, we, we got direction uh, from management that uh, we needed to update the fact sheet and say, you know, we really should be giving our recommendations because it was kind of an evolving process through then. There was notification letters from the Air Force DEQ. The DEQ's letter arrived in people's mailboxes. The phone started ringing on my desk. What does this mean, should I stop drinking my water? We discussed it in-house and we said, yeah, you should stop drinking that water. So we made that recommendation and then, the, then we decided we needed to change that fact sheet to say that was our recommendation and here is when the public meeting was. 
I apologize that we did not change the front of that fact sheet so that you would know it was updated. Because when it, was show, when it showed up in the letter that came from State Health, I think that threw more people uh, into a quandary because they were saying, wait, I got this fact sheet, but wait, it says something different. So I'm, I, I really am sorry for that. I mean, this is stressful enough without all these letters and two fact sheets that have the same title but look different on the back side. So then local health were conducting the in-person in outreach in February, and then um, both the local health department and the township sent a letter to the state health department and asked that there be an expedited review of the data so that it would be available before this public meeting. Now it's not available publicly yet. It should be on the website soon, but um, we did, we're, we're able to get it to the township and to the uh, local public health so they could have it ready. So that was done in March. And somebody had their hand raised over here, ma'am? I, I wonder what precipitated you testing the, the person who owned this older mobile home spent $700 and had their well tested? Or did you come in and test it? Okay, the question was, is how did it turn out that the mobile home park was right. tested? D did the person who managed the park have the testing done? My understanding is that uh, a database was being reviewed at the MDEQ and they noticed that there was a type one well in this area near the Wordsmith Air Force Base that was not realized before, as far as I know. So therefore, we figured, okay, well, we better have that tested right now because when the old contamination, I call it old, when the contamination at the base was first discovered years ago, that was chlorinated solvents and uh, petroleum products, uh, total petroleum and uh, BTEX. So that was, that was started to be addressed. That's been under remedial effort since that was found. And at that time, uh, municipal water was run out to the base. And I believe that people were, people who lived off the base were given the opportunity to, have, to hook up, but there was not a requirement to hook up. So you initiated it, not the homeowner? Right, the state, the state and the Air Force initiated it. Um, it, okay, so the statement was that only in the certain areas um, were they given the option not up by Colbath Road, which is north of Dry Creek, right? Okay, and when you were talking about the option, that w it was the option to hook up to the municipal system? Okay, I, I was not aware of that. Thank you for that clarification. Right, it was a, it was a different contamination when it was first discovered. Okay, um, let me see. So this shows, this shows, and, and we've talked about this already, the, the area that is uh, under the investigation here. And Dale, you can go ahead to the next slide. Okay. Let's talk about this a little bit before we talk about the data. Air Force and the DEQ, if you, were, if you got a letter from both of them and you compared the results in that letter, you probably noticed a difference. There's a difference in numbers because it's different labs. But for such a low unit, that part per trillion, that is a really tiny amount. So it's enough to waver a little bit. And it's not like, I was describing this to somebody before, it's not like uh, it was 20 in one and 120 in another. It was more like 20 in one and 22 in the other. So it's really the same thing. And the other thing that I was pointing out is to describe it to somebody on the phone is when you are baking something and you measure out a liquid, you know, milk or, or, or oil or whatever, and it calls for half a cup, how do you know that's a half a cup and not maybe a teaspoon more or a teaspoon less? It's about a half a cup. It's still a half a cup. I don't know. I was baking at the time when I made that, uh, when I made that 
well, I was baking mentally anyways at the time when I made that comparison. But the person I was talking to could relate to that. So I'm hoping that you can sort of relate to that. Okay, so I wanted to point out the difference. And then for my evaluation, I used DEQ's data. Just simply that they could, uh, their lab reported a few other um, PFCs that were not reported by Air Force's lab, but also Air Force's lab reported a couple of PFCs that DEQ's lab did not. Labs are different. The bulk of the um, PFCs were the same from lab to lab as far as which ones they were reporting on. All right, now I want to get into the next slide. Okay. I want to tell you that this is not a numbers deal. We are not holding a number out there saying, Do, does your well go over or under that number? And I'll show you why it's not a numbers deal. This is showing the amount of PFOA, P-F-O-A, in, in each drinking water sample. So here at the top, the very top, that is the municipal system, that's Hushra. We got, a, we got a sample from Hushra because we wanted to know uh, what, what kind of comparison it was. The next one down is the mobile home park, and then 1 through 25 are the well samples. I think there was one property that had two wells on it, and, but it still counted as a separate sample. So out here on the right side of the slide, that is the EPA provisional health advisory number for PFOA. Look at this. These are way lower. If you, if you just use 400 as your criterion, you're below it. It doesn't seem like a big deal. Next slide, please. This is the same situation for PFOS. The PFOS EPA provisional health advisory number is 200. And again, these are much below that. Hold on, Dale. But then you put all the PFCs together. Now, this is what it looks like when you add these all up. It doesn't matter what the number is out here. But you can see that there's a lot of other PFCs in there. And we don't have enough toxicity information about these to understand how each one works on its own or in a mixture. Chris, yes? Could you explain what a provisional health advisory is? Okay, the question has been asked to explain what a provisional health advisory is. The EPA has set short-term short values to compare uh, water that has PFCs in it, too. And these values are such whereas if they are exceeded, then action is suggested so that exposure does not happen. Drinking, drinking the water exposure does not happen. These values that EPA has set, there's only, they've only set them for two PFCs. And if you recall, Dale mentioned that there's something like 3,000 PFCs out there. And we're, we're seeing you know, the, these here, and these are the common ones, and more common ones. So we can compare numbers to the provisional health advisory for PFOA, PFOA, or PFOS, PFOS, but we don't have numbers to compare these other ones to it. And that's one of the things that just kind of raised our eyebrows at the health department when we were looking at these data saying, what, did the, was, what does this mean? Now, before we go to the next slide, yeah, you're probably asking yourself, well, what does this number mean as far as um, the water coming from the municipal system? They're getting that from Lake Huron. Well, the state, um, MDHHS, along with MDEQ, in another, in another area of MDEQ, conducted a study a couple of years ago looking at PFCs in surface water around the state, so lakes and rivers, and also looking at the, the fish that were in those, uh, and did some analyses of fish from those waters. But go ahead and turn that to the next slide, Dale. On this slide, this is kind of a blow up. So yeah, it looks big, that's because it's been blown up. 
But this is the Hushra water. This is the Duquamanon River. The Duquamanon River, you think pristine, um, but there's, there's a bar, a couple of colors there rep representing a couple of PFCs in it. I, I discussed before that these PFCs are global contaminants. There is no local source, as far as we know, to the Tequamanon River. And yet, there's just a little bit of PFCs in them. Same thing with the Thunder Bay River, no known local source. And the Muskegon River, not down in Muskegon, but way up towards the headwaters of that. So what we're seeing from Lake Huron is actually quite typical of other surface waters around the state and likely very typical of other surface waters around the world. Let's move up to the next slide. So the considerations we had when looking at the data for the drinking water wells was, yes, they do not exceed the EPA provisional numbers, but we can connect the dots between the contamination at Wordsmith Air Force Base to the drinking water wells. We've, we've seen the, the estimate of the plumes, what they look like, have an understanding that groundwater is moving that way. The PFCs that we are seeing at the Wordsmith Air Force Base, the same types, are showing up in these drinking water wells. We are concerned that the contamination is neither fully understood nor fully controlled. It's, it's getting controlled at the fire training site so that it doesn't go down into Clark's Marsh. But there are other areas that need to be better characterized to understand the plume so, and also to determine what's going to be the best way to take care of those. The PFCs in the well water are higher than in the municipal system. So it's, it's not like it's something that, oh, this is just because of the way PFCs are global contaminants, not, in the, not for the ones that are in the well water. Animal and human studies have led us to believe that there's a potential for harm. There have been animal studies, quite a few animal studies on PFOA and PFOS, and not as many, but a few animal studies on some of the other PFCs. And then the human studies have been populations where there have been releases of PFCs to the environment. For instance, uh, DuPont released primarily PFOA to the Ohio River between Ohio and West Virginia. That's called the C8 study. If you're doing your, if you're doing your internet homework, you will find information on that. Um, 3M up in Minnesota had some releases around the uh, Mississippi River. A lot of work done up there. So we were finding, I shouldn't say we, but researchers have found, in some cases, probable links, we don't say causes, we say probable links, between certain health outcomes and the exposure. And then there seems to be some associations uh, in regard to other, certain, uh, other health outcomes. We do know that PFCs are persistent in the environment. They're gonna stay around for a long time and that they bioaccumulate. We've seen that in the fish. We have also learned that some PFCs have long half-lives in humans. In, in, uh, for PFOA, it's understood, and when I, when I talk about half-lives, that means the amount of time it takes for an amount in a body to be reduced by half. So assuming that no more is coming in, how, does it, how long does it take for the body to bring that down by half? For um, PFOA, it's somewhere in the order between two to four years. For PFOS, it's about five years. And for one of those PFCs in the mix, uh, PFHXS, that is um, it's believed to be around eight to 10 years. So these are the things that we thought about when looking at the data and looking at the situation. Next, please. So, um, so our conclusion was ongoing exposure to PFCs in the drinking water wells could cause harm. So our recommendations 
to the MDEQ and to the US Air Force were to prevent the public's exposure to the site-related PFCs. That meant sampling the remaining wells in the area of interest, monitor upstream and learn more about the, the plumes so we can control them. Our recommendations to well owners, you're already well aware of that. The precautionary advice that we are issuing is to use water without elevated PFCs for drinking and cooking. I want to make clear to you because I've understood that there have been questions about this and I even heard some today. Bathing with this water is okay. Swimming in this water is fine. Washing hands and dishes, laundering, is fine. Next, please. Okay, we do need to think about other exposures that could be happening in this area. We've already talked about the fish, we've evaluated the fish, the report is out there. I, I really do encourage you to read it. I am sorry, here I go apologizing again. Um, it's a bit sciencey, and that that is usually boring to me. Um, so I'm hopeful that you can get something out of it and provide us feedback that would make it a better document as far as um, you understanding it and making sure that it's what you feel is correct and what is scientifically correct. There may be a question about watering vegetable gardens. Minnesota, with their experience with the contamination from 3M, conducted a study in which they watered gardens with PFC containing water. And it didn't really look like any kind of uptake in the plants. So if you are, if you are using your well water to water your vegetable garden, continue doing that. I don't have a problem with that. There's the question about eating wild game. Well, what we do know is that the U.S. Geological Service um, conducted studies on tree swallows at Clark's Marsh, and they found that there was an impact uh, that was found in their eggs, in their crop, which is their forest or stomach, I guess, um, and then I believe in some of their uh, plasma too. Uh, research in New York has shown PFCs and waterfowl from affected water bodies and the waterfowl that are eating the fish are higher than the puddle ducks. And we have questions about deer, turkey, and wild game. These would be closer in to Clark's Marsh because um, animals that are not going to have a wide, a wide territory and probably um, bucks for deer would. I see your hand back there. Just give me a second, please. Um, the, the bucks may wander a bit more, but after speaking with the DNR, they said the does kind of stay in close. So if, if they are using the Clark's Marsh area, I would have some questions about that. And we are hoping to answer those questions at some time. I'm going to get through the rest of my slides, and then I'll, I would hope that we can get your question first. So, some of the rumors that have been reported to me and that I've wanted to get clarified, just in case you are hearing this, you can educate your neighbors about this in case they bring it to you. Are wells outside of the investigation area okay? They are expected to enter surface water and flow out to Lake Huron. Bob talked about that during his question and answer time. And yes, we did talk about the possibility of um, wells on the east side of the Nettin Creek near the dam possibly getting impacted, so that's something that we want to look into. Uh, we want to be sure about that. Is it okay to use well water for pets? I would say if you treat your pets like family, do the same thing for them that you would do for your family. And I know that some people came to me talking today uh, about their horses. I know this is going to be a difficult uh, it's, it's going to be a hardship while you have larger uh, animals, if you have horses, other livestock, and I'm hoping that we can find the resolution to this problem soon, especially for situations like that. One of the rumors that was being circulated was about the dredging of the river mouth. 
the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers clears out the, the harbor area every so often, every, every few years. And the rumor that was circulating was that the sand that they were dredging up and spreading on the beaches was contaminated with PFCs. No. That's the short answer. Here's the backup for that. PFCs in the river water are very low. The um, concentrations from a sample taken up at the put-in on Rhea Road, that's non-detect. Then a sample taken at the river um, where River Road crosses it, so it's, it's further downstream, it's downstream from three pipes, I believe, and from other inputs into the river. That had 19 part per trillion total PFCs. So very low, it's, it's lower, um, it's, it's lower than what was in the mobile home park, I believe. Uh, so very low, and also the dredged material is nearly all sand. The PFCs are wanna, gonna wanna glom onto other organic matter if they're going to hang on to any solids. So they're gonna wanna glom onto and adhere to um, silt and any clays that are in the sediment. That's why we're seeing it in the sediment in Clark's Marsh. There's a lot of organic matter in the bottom of those ponds. They're not, going to, they're not expected to stick to the sand at all. And it's a similar argument for Hull Island. Apparently somebody was cooking a rumor as far as, and I'm sorry, I, I know I'm taking a long time, but I got a lot of information to give you. Um, the PFCs, again, in the river, very low. There's really no source to the island itself. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, home stretch here. And I don't know if we need to do a, a seventh inning stretch before we move on to the other presenters. But these are the contact information, and it's also got the mailing information, and that is also on my uh, business card if you want to use that. Or you can, uh, you can send by, by email too. Then for uh, web resources, we have a web page that's specific for our wordsmith work. But then also we have our Eat Safe Fish website. And that's not just for fishing around here. Anywhere you go in the state, we will have some advice for a good majority of the water bodies and the fish in those areas. So we encourage you to use that so you can enjoy your sport, enjoy the, the fish that you catch as a good healthy meal. We want you, we want you out there fishing and, and eating good healthy fish. Next. So I think, Sue, I'm going to take the, the lady in the back there had her hand up a little while ago. I just, uh, when listening to your um, saying that lots of other rivers have contaminants and it's no big deal, apparently, but then why is the PFC issue such a big deal? And I haven't heard any um, harmful effects. I, I'd like to know what PSC can do to us okay. instead of saying it can harm you. Well, how can it harm you? you apparently, there wasn't enough, um, uh, you don't know enough about it. Right, the, the question is, what is the toxicity of PFCs? Well, what we were concerned about for PFOS when we were looking at it in fish was information that we had gotten from uh, a study that was done in monkeys where they, were fed PFs, uh, where, where they were fed a diet that contained PFOS in it, PFOS, and we were seeing changes in the thyroid and cholesterol, I'm trying to think of what else, certain, certain thyroid hormone levels, and uh, that, that also can, with the cholesterol, can lead to an issue with the liver. So that was what we were using for that. With PFOA, we're looking a lot at the probable links that came about from the C8 study. So there were probable links to certain kind of cancers. Um, I know, I believe kidney was one of them, testicular cancer was another one. Uh, also pregnancy induced hypertension. Hypertension, thank you, voice inside my head. Um, 
And there, there were other issues there, and, and just to remember them off the top of my head, I, I apologize that I can't pull them straight up. Um, we may have more sheets of, well, this, this was actually more than 75. We were estimating a turnout of 75, so that's what we printed out. But um, there, it will have a link on our web page to the ATSDR website that has a really good short fact sheet about the concerns that have been raised based on both animal studies and human studies for potential of harmful health effects. But uh, there's talk about a, a lowered immune response uh, for children getting vaccines, that their titer does not go as high. Um, if they've been exposed to PFCs, there's, there's been suggestions about that. There's been suggestions as far as developmental effects uh, on children, potentially on the fetus, uh, fertility problems. It's, it's, if you have a problem, a, a health outcome, a health problem that is within the list of what is, uh, PFCs are linked to, we can't say that any exposure that you had, you personally had, led to that health outcome. Because a lot of these are really nonspecific. There could be other issues that cause it. But we look at this from, um, from basically a risk aspect in that we've seen this, we've seen this happen in animals. It is, it is not. That helps us balance the um, balance the data as far as whether it is applicable to human, humans, and then we determine, well, then what kind of risk does that pose? So it's, it's, not, a, it's, not, um, it's not laying the odds that saying, well, you know, you were, you were drinking this for 20 years, plus you ate the fish in the area, oh gosh, and you ate some of the wild game. Well, that means this is gonna happen to you. We can't do that. There's just no way. We do not have that crystal ball. Therefore, a lot of what we do in the public health department field is to give precautionary advice. Chris, I was just going to mention, if you want to read, a colleague of ours summarized about 100 publications in a nice, uh, you know, 40 pages. You can read all the toxicology about human health effects and all the experimental studies done on animals. So within about three hours, you will know what we know. And it's all there in black and white. Online, online. Corey, have you handed out those cards yet? Yes, I have. And okay. I'll give you some more. If you more. would like a document that is not available, or we've talked about, and you would like to provide your email, name and email address to us, we will email that to you. Just let us know which documents you'd like. Let's take two more questions for Chris and then let's move along. Again, we will have a question and answer session and we'll get to your questions. And I don't know who to pick first, let's. Yeah, well, I, I'm just curious. Um, I'm not really up on parts for the What would this be in parts for million? Okay. To get to, parts, to get to parts per million from parts per trillion, you would divide it by? A million. A million. So you're basically moving the decimal point. I gotta, I gotta put a blackboard in front of me. You're moving the decimal point that way, six points, six, six spaces. So it's much easier to go from parts per million to parts to, per trillion, one part per million. It's easier to go from parts per million to parts per trillion. You would multiply whatever you have for parts per million by a million. Because it's million, billion, trillion. It takes a thousand to get to billion, a thousand times more to get to trillion. Does that help? I know, it's, it's math and it stinks. Okay, now can we discuss okay. that we have these things in our area and it's probably not good for our health. How do we go about getting city water? Okay, we the question... We've been trying to get city water and we keep being told we're not in the flume and it's going to cost a billion dollars. 
We'd like some city water. Okay, the question statement is that they would like to be on city water. Yeah. Nobody seems to have that answer. I asked a bunch of people today. I think that some, some answers and then some information about the ongoing discussions is still going to be shared during these presentations. And I don't, I don't have that information. It's the presenters who are following me. 